And then Dr. Ruth is just like, what you need is some dick. What you're going to need is some yeah. long, hard, thrusting <laughs> anus. Seems like you need some cock to me. You seem like you want some cock and you don't have any cock. And you consider some fucking cock. <laughs> she's just eating a big sloppy meatball slump while she says it. Don't like you need to get fucked. You know there's no cock, right? They're like, just, they just turn right off when we die. Nothing but the dark. <laughs> God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema, or you motherfuckers would riot. I'm your host, No Illusions. Heath's going to be unable to join us, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? I loved this movie. <laughs> so did I. And Heath would have hated the shit out of this. It's a great yep. week for him to be on. <laughs> and in his place, we're excited to welcome in this week's guest masochist, actress and comedian, Amy Lynn Stewart. Amy, welcome to God Awful Movies. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited. Are you really, though? Because like, a lot of times people say that. It's it's so, it's embarrassing how excited I am to be talking about this movie. <laughs> All right, so tell us, what will we be breaking down today? Okay, so we are breaking down Princess Cut, which is an extremely bizarre movie about... It's like right? propaganda about the dangers of kissing <laughs> and hugging before marriage. <laughs> you know, your dad is always going to be involved in your romantic relationships. You should You should never kiss anyone really even Ever. after they I'm, even after you're married yes really. just to be on the safe side yeah even after you have children yeah <laughs> oh yeah yeah and and women shouldn't go to college no mm -hmm. no point in that and they should marry older men just pull cookies out of ovens yeah <laughs> <laughs> that their dads choose for them yes that yeah. their exactly. dads choose for them that's that's the main the, i mean the overarching theme is that the dad chooses the daughter's husband for her and she must absolutely Absolutely, be a virgin. Yes, when she's married, <laughs> and rely on man wisdom is the moral of the story. Always, always, they know best. Daddy knows best. Yeah, and Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you love the family dynamics of incest porn, but you want the <laughs> plotting of a page by page children's book, you <laughs> will love this movie. Oh, uh, it was so okay. So, like to. Give the audience an idea of the kind of bad we're dealing with. So the production quality was, I'd say, Hallmark movie level. Yeah, sure. Oh, totally, right? totally. But so they, they knew where the lights went. They knew how the camera worked, that kind of shit. We've seen, like, yeah. unlike last week, they knew how a camera worked. The acting was at medium budget horror movie level, <laughs> right? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Not terrible, but not good by any stretch of the imagination. But the writing. The writing in this movie was fucking Twilight fan fiction level. I feel like that's that's even going too far. Really bad. <laughs> okay, so bad Twilight fan, like low level Twilight fan. Yeah, low none level. of this Fifty Shades of Grey stuff. You know? yeah. <laughs> Written by a middle schooler. The, the writer didn't even seem to know how movies worked. Like, what was the general purpose of them? Nobody was good at their job, but compared to the writing, everything else was pure fucking gold. <laughs> it's like... You remember how when missionaries first came to Papua New Guinea and they gave people the Bible and then they fucked off and they came back and they were burning witches and they had to be like, oh, I'm sorry. That's just a meta. We just wanted you to give us 10% of your income. Yeah, right. Yeah. I feel like that's this is the cinematic screenwriting <laughs> version of that. <laughs> is that someone gave I kiss dating goodbye to like an alien and then it came back with this screenplay and we were like, fuck, they got lit. We don't want to get Independence Day. Let's just make this movie <laughs> on the down low. <sighs> All right, so is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? I'm going to nominate it for worst, best at, how do, what is it? Being the best at being the worst at. Yes. Symbolism and pacing. Okay. Sure. <laughs> but the soybeans symbolize how love grows over time. <laughs> oh, and the, and the wild horses picture above her bed and then the strategically placed whip hanging on the doctor's yes. wall. I mean, it's like, oh, come on. No, no, really? You're doing that? 
I missed that one. And then the pacing. I mean, the pacing. Yeah. It's like clawing your eyes out by the end. I can't even, I'm spe- it's like, oh, I can't. I'm just trying, I feel traumatized. I feel trauma, actually, from the pacing. <laughs> it's as though they rolled dice <laughs> and they were like, okay, that's how many minutes this scene gets. And then they rolled the <laughs> dice again. They were like, oh, well, the big love scene, that only gets two minutes. So they just, all the time spent in the movie on whatever it is, is arbitrary. <laughs> I feel like none of them knew their lines. And so they're like, okay, 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 here's the line. Say the line. And then they say it. And then the uh, next person's like, okay, here's my line. <laughs> okay, I'm saying my line. The whole movie. The whole the movie was paced like a goddamn traffic jam, right? Like yep. the, there was never any momentum. The movie would just stop dead and you'd be going like, okay, what's the conflict now? And it'd be like, hold on, hold on. We got to wait for the car in front of us to move. There's nothing. Honestly, if there was a dead motorcyclist at the end of this movie, I'd be like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's what everyone's been <laughs> Looking at, okay. Okay, so I was going to go, and, and we've seen a lot of these, but I'm still going to go here. Best worst evil psychiatrist. Oh, Certainly the yes. fastest. <laughs> I, she just shows up for one scene and steals the whole fucking movie and my heart. And my yeah. heart. I just, I love her so fucking much. We'll get there. She's she, She's worth the wait, though. She is worth the wait. Yes. Yeah, she's important. And I'm going to take the easy one. I'm going to go with best worst villain resolution. (laughs) I'm going to spoil it for you. One of the villains of this movie is literally escorted out of the movie politely. Yes. (laughs) I think you should go. And they do. Yes, both of the villains. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Nothing happens in this movie, but it's a lot of nothing. So we're going to pause to warm ourselves up to the task. But we'll be back in a flash with all the technically a plot that is princess cut now a word from our sponsor better help see i can't get the recording light to turn off yeah have you, have you tried yelling at it or uh, like punching it not sure how that's gonna fix the soundboard oh ooh. have you picked it up and slammed it back down on the desk no hey noah apropos of nothing have you ever considered therapy <laughs> therapy for what for problem solving It can be tough to train your brain to stay in problem-solving mode when faced with a challenge in life. But when you learn how to find your own solutions, there's no better feeling. A therapist can help you become a better problem-solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small. Wow. I I thought therapy was just for when you were like super sad or something really bad happened to you. Not at all. Therapy is a great way to take care of your brain, just like any other doctor's visit. I go to therapy regularly, no matter how I'm feeling, which is why I, Eli Bosnick, personally endorse going to therapy for a variety of mental health reasons. And if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. Get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey and switch therapists anytime you need to. Nice. Where do I sign up? When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash awful today. Get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash awful. Nice. Now, can you help me with the soundboard? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Did you try punching it? See, that's what I said. (laughs) Well. All right, everyone. Welcome to the first writer's room meeting for Princess Cut. Woo! Woo! Now, before we get started, let me just go around and introduce everybody. First up, y'all remember Fred. He suffered a traumatic brain injury during the Hallmark movie Marathon last year. Pumpkins. That's right, buddy, pumpkins. Next up, Rachel McGovern. She's 14 years old, and her parents told her about purity too early, so now she just sort of wanders around the middle school exuding hormones and mental illness. I burned my Twilight books for Jesus. Sure did. And and last but not least, this is a button that has the words never mind on it. Anytime there's a conflict introduced in the movie for more than what would make grandma comfortable as she falls into a sleep, she sprays means death. We're going to just go ahead and slap that bad boy to keep her from changing the channel. Any questions? Pumpkins. Yeah, Fred, we can put some pumpkins in the movie. That explains a lot. (laughs) Yeah, we're back for the breakdown and we're going to forego all the logo shit that we normally get, at least in the copy that we found on Tubi. <laughs> and we're going to go straight into some dude digging. 
Yeah, nobody wanted to take uh, credit for this movie. <laughs> yeah, that makes it sense. came time to put the logos up front, and everyone was like, you know what? We're we good. Should... Just let the art speak for itself. <laughs> and I can tell you what, this is this guy's uh, first experience with a shovel, I do believe. <laughs> <laughs> also, I mean, have you noticed that he's digging a very shallow hole, whatever it is? Mm-hmm. I mean, the hole's like six inches deep. How how is that going to work? Yeah, you know that whatever he's burying is going to come up in the first big rain. Yes, yeah, yep. exactly. Mm-hmm. I wrote in my notes this was supposed to be very dramatic and not the best metal detector find ever. Right, because the <laughs> thing he's burying is a big ass engagement ring. Right, and you but it, it starts out like for I feel at the top of the movie is the best part of the movie. The first. 10 seconds of the movie is the best part mm-hmm. because you're like, Ooh, it's, it's, it's a mystery. Someone's been murdered. Something's going right. to happen. And then it's like, no <laughs> dude with a clearly brand new wardrobe is burying a ring. Yes. Like a wedding ring. That's it. The least interesting thing a guy could possibly be burying in the middle of the night in the forest. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, and then we cut from there, we cut to a, a lady she is looking at, as she's at a jewelry store, she's looking at engagement rings, hoping that one day she'll get one of these, right? <laughs> and again, the pacing in this movie is so bad, right? From the get-go. Right. She's supposed to be like, oh, maybe someday, but they don't know how to pace a scene. So Nathan Fielder's stunt double, who will be the romantic <laughs> lead for the first half of the movie, walks over and he's like, would you like to see this? And she's like, no, the scene is over now. And he's like, the scene can't possibly be over. <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> Notice how she's strategically kneeling down at the start. We we oh, greet yeah. her kneeling down, Ooh. kneeling before the man, right? Right. Ooh. Yeah. So, and then her friend comes in. Her friend, this is her friend Tessa. And Tessa's like, hey, Grace, we've got to go. This scene is over. And she's like, see, I told you the scene is over. <laughs> and, and I wrote my notes. I wrote, wow, this this is our 368th movie and our 367th lead female character named Grace. How's that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> or sorry, sorry, half of them have been Faith, haven't they? Never mind. Yeah, we've gotten some Grace Faith. And faith. And some, mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, so Grace and her friend Tessa are leaving the jewelry store together. And it sounds like they're in a tunnel. But notice yeah, oh, they yes. sound like they're in a tunnel when they're walking to the car. Oh, it's so they have no idea how to capture audio outdoors. I can hear at one point, I'm not making this shit up, the radio of one of the cars driving <laughs> by. Yep, you sure can. <laughs> but yeah, so in their effort to try to, you know, fail the Bechdel test as quickly as possible, they're like, so tell me about your boyfriend. Do you think he's going to propose tonight? She says, I do think he's going to propose tonight. I was like, I bet he doesn't propose tonight. <laughs> yeah. She lets us know that it's been 15 whole months. And uh, Amy, in case you're confused, that's 44 years of dating in Christian time. Yes. So it's definitely proposal o'clock. And then they do the highly choreographed, silent hand gesture, call me. And then they yes. get into their cars at the exact same time. <laughs> yes. Right. And, it, and, and all I could think was, how long did it take them to get that right? It was like, okay, <laughs> friends it. Okay, this is our friends <laughs> shot. Oh my God, it's so stupid. It's like you guys could just get in cars like normal humans, right? Oh yeah, I'm sure we will be able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so and so she starts driving home, and just when you're thinking to yourself, well, at least this doesn't have a chintzy ass voiceover, in cuts the chintzy ass voiceover. <laughs> this is the only time we will ever hear it, and all it says to us is, "My mom and dad sure do love country living." Country living. Yeah. <laughs> my my notes literally say, "I sure do love the country." Herka durka durk. <laughs> and then the perfectly timed, she pulls up, and there's the classic perv on the porch waiting for her to wave. And he's wearing the overalls and the flannels. Mm-hmm. And it's like, there's mm-hmm. old Uncle Bob. You want to go sit on his lap? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Because they're like, oh, people wave to each other and know each other's name. If you're from a small town, which I am, that's the guy who won't stop talking to you about 9 11 while you get your burrito <laughs> from the only Mexican restaurant in town. <laughs> so, so Grace goes home to her parents. She comes into it like do we, we meet her mom first and she comes in. She's like, Mom, you wouldn't believe what I saw in the last scene. She's like, the movie's called Princess Cut. Was it a Princess Cut Diamond? She's like, Sh- to act surprised. God damn it. Fine. Yeah. Hey, Noah, that princess cut, is that ever, 
ever fucking going to come back? She will not even express a preference no. for it. Keep in mind that the first scene, as Amy hinted, is a guy burying a ring. <laughs> of all the things that they had to keep track of when they opened that shitty box, they <laughs> needed it to be a princess cut diamond. But nope, nope, that is gone. Gone from the film. Yep. Completely. Oh my God, you're right. Completely gone. Except for when she does her choreographed princess cut, bite into the cookie, of which we will see many more. And then right after to die for. And it was like, no, no, no. What's happening? What's happening? <laughs> and there, the pacing. Yeah. Oh, let's talk about the mother who enters with the laundry basket under her arm oh because she's God. the mom and she's always she carries the laundry <laughs> basket into the kitchen and then puts the laundry basket with strategically placed clothes over it just in case you didn't realize it was a laundry basket yes and then puts it on the counter in the kitchen it's like who who brings their laundry into the <laughs> kitchen nobody does that Yep. We will never see this character without her being doing so, like some cliche mom thing, right? She's conscious. She's always put baking a cookie, wearing an apron, cleaning yeah. a something, folding some laundry. Yeah. Let me let me give you this map that I did. All right. She has 16 lines in the movie. <gasps> she pulls out of the oven four batches of cookies. <laughs> she pulls out a batch of cookies for every four lines she speaks in the film. I can't believe you tracked that. I did because I was like, this is a lot of fucking cookies. <laughs> I can't believe you tracked also that she only had 16 lines. Yeah, no, I was, because I was like, is this woman, because I thought to myself, I was like, maybe they were trying to make her an under five. They were like, we're going to pay a fucking sag after it. Just go pull out some more cookies you featured <laughs> extra but no she's an over five. Oh yeah well i mean the, well and we'll see later the reason she doesn't speak is because she is not allowed to speak right no Un unless spoken to also can we talk about the the lighting of the mom throughout this movie yeah like you immediately see she's backlit in this very weird way and it's like was this accidental and they just didn't know what to do with the lighting like the sunlight's coming from behind or is it like oh you have this angelic quality the mother I think you're it, the madonna I think, I think they purposely did that yes i think you're right yeah if faces of meth did a baking soda <laughs> series of posters <laughs> this would be mom oh, God. and i want to point out if you're if you're a regular listener the main character in this one grace is the same chick that played abby in unplanned so mm -hmm. we've, we've seen her in a couple of them before i did my research that seems like that was a very well-known popular movie that she did yes it was <laughs> oh yeah people loved that one produced by the my pillow guy and i didn't know about that one i'm gonna have to listen to that episode also my Question from the very beginning, and I will continue to ask this question, is how old is the daughter? Yes. Great question. Right? How old is she? I think she's supposed to be in her early 20s, which is pretty discordant with the way that dad treats her. But they never say that, right? No. They never say she's in her early 20s, correct? No. no only okay. in their promotional material. <laughs> She has a project for school, which at one point is a poster. Yes. <laughs> which I feel like a college student doesn't have. I feel like she must be like maybe at a community college or she's like a senior in high school who's going, taking community colleges, classes, you know? I think she's supposed to be like college aged, but she's not in college because she, or, but well, she lives at she's home. She's in, yeah, maybe a community. So she's, she's going, yeah. Yes. And her dad treats her like she's 15. Maybe there's a prequel with a head injury that makes a lot of her behavior there you go. make sense. <laughs> so mom's like, hey, go get your brother and your dad. So she jumps on the fucking four wheeler and literally goes out to the amber waves of grain <laughs> to fetch her dad and her brother. The brand new four wheeler, I want to point out. Like the <laughs> oh, it's nice. It's they, they didn't impeccably brand new four wheeler. So somebody got to write that off on their taxes as long as they used it in the movie. <laughs> Yep, I, I feel like sure. that's why it was such a nice one. Yeah. And by the, so dad to me looked like if you tried to make jerky out of Pete Buttigieg. <laughs> Ooh. He was like, that's, that's dad. We, we've seen him and uh, he was in War Room. He was in Courageous. He's been a part of the show for a very long time. Oh, okay. I have him as Pastor Ted Haggerty, who Pastor Ted Haggerty masturbates to. <laughs> Wait, I just have to point out very quickly when he says Grace 
Just look at this land. And then he proceeds to turn his back to the camera and gesture behind <laughs> him away from the land. Yes. Yep. Okay, I'm moving. I, I'm done. That's it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, no. And, and of course, it's it's so clumsily put in there. He's just look at this land that's been in our family for three generations, and you know, it's like, oh, why would why would you bring that up? Oh, you know, it's a, it, important to the plot later. But okay, so now we we cut back to the house. Mom's getting everybody ready for dinner. This is where we meet the little brother. This is uh, Drew. He'll be my favorite character in the movie. Yes. Oh my god. Yeah, I do like the little brother. At this point, the country, like, hallmarkiness of this movie was so sickly sweet. I just wrote in my notes, can I just watch Merle Haggard fuck a pickup truck for 90 <laughs> minutes instead of this movie? <laughs> Instead of some guy, Brussels sprouts are yucky, I don't please. like Brussels sprouts. Yeah, first world problem, kid. <laughs> uh, and we, oh, and the, also, I should have said best, worst, inexplicable close-ups on nothing literally like yep. cut to yeah this like bizarre quivering mashed potatoes that's really just like glue maybe that's like a big bowl mm -hmm. of glue for the mashed potatoes it's like why why am i being forced to look at this what's happening yeah it's not even appetizing looking <laughs> no it's like this movie was edited by somebody playing immortality <laughs> sorry because I'm, so I'm speaking to like eight listeners there but anyways <laughs> so but they loved that shit. Yeah, no, I, they I bet fucking they did. loved it. I bet they did. Okay, so, but Grace isn't going to eat dinner with the family. She's got a big date with Stuart, right? Stuart. Mm -hmm. And so, and then the phone rings. And this is one of the most amazing, <laughs> this movie was written by a 72-year-old moments of the movie. Because apparently the person who wrote this movie is aware that families just have cell phones instead of landlines now. But they think that that's just a, a cell phone that's like a house cell phone that sits where the... <laughs> house phone used to go or something right because the phone rings the, the kid's like cell phone yes yeah. it's just sitting in the kitchen the kid's like i'll get it and he runs up and he answers the fucking phone and that's the phone like <laughs> later on she will have her own cell phone right in this fucking movie this 2015 fucking movie but they have to have the moment where the little brother gets uh, answers the phone and won't give it to her or whatever yeah, they they make several attempts at like sibling rivalry between these two characters, except neither of them can act. So instead of it being like good natured, he'll be like, she'll be like, Drew, give me the phone. And then there's an insanely violent silence between them. <laughs> <laughs> and then the scene just moves on. Also, wait, I have to point out. Is nobody going to talk about the bizarrely brightly lit windows in the dining room? It's like they have yeah. floodlights on in the outside <laughs> of the it's, dining room, but it's supposed to be night, yet this bizarre bright light is coming through. <laughs> There's more lighting. I should have said best, worst lighting. Yeah, no, it, it, it made a lot. It, there were a lot of choices for that uh, uh, for that answer. So, okay, so, but the phone call she's getting is from Stuart. He's not going to pick her up. He wants her to just meet her, him at the diner. And now up to this point, she's been like, oh, mom, help me pick out the best outfit for my, for my big date. They're going to a fucking diner. So she's getting dressed up for like huddle house, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. So, okay. So we cut to the big date at the fucking five guys or whatever that they're having. <laughs> And wouldn't you know it, Stuart isn't even there by himself. He's brought a bunch of friends. Yeah, his college friends, all of whom are, I'm going to go ahead and say tentatively, 90? <laughs> well, <laughs> physically 90, mentally 8, right? There will be a burping contest that happens amongst these friends at one point. Mm -hmm. A burping contest. Right, but wait, we're clear that she only is going to be marrying older men. Well, that's true. Right, so it makes yes. sense that they're older. Well, in this case, they'd be senior citizens. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But the friends immediately roll their eyes when they see her. I think that's to establish like they're heathens automatically. Right, well, we don't know why they're rolling their eyes. They look down on her because she's not in college with them, maybe. I don't, I don't know. It's entirely unclear what's happening. She seems to think she is going to be going on a romantic date with her boyfriend who is about to propose to her. They seem to think they're having a college meetup with the friends they go to school to. And the two actors will not acknowledge the other one's reality at all. It's like a Meisner exercise <laughs> happening in the middle of the, of the fucking 
movie. Well, right. It, it, and they overdo it so badly, right? Any one of these seven things they gave us would have been enough to be like, oh, well, Stuart's just not the right guy for her, right? And that's all we need from this scene. But no, he like brings his friends along and he doesn't even sit with her. He like sticks somebody in between him and her. And then he announces that he's engaged to a different chick. Yeah. Which <laughs> which is a really baffling thing considering he called her and told her to meet him there. Like, right. Hey, I think the best way to break this to you would be in person in front of all my friends as a surprise. <laughs> you know what I think? I don't think they were ever dating. I don't think he ever thought they were <gasps> dating. They never kissed. Oh, that's true. How the fuck would he know they're dating? You're right. He thinks she's just a good friend. You're right. Like she thought she won't even hug before no, marriage. We learn no, as we learn he, later. She's just insane. <laughs> he just thinks she's like a friend. She's showing up like being like a total nut job. Also, it's like if she thinks that he's her boyfriend, wouldn't she want to like meet his friends and act like a normal right. human being? And, and get in on the burping contest with him. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and also like the diner setting. She, and they're they're not drinking. They're not smoking. They're not doing no. anything. And she's literally acting like they're at a strip club. Like, like shooting <laughs> heroin. Right. She's acting physically revolted by their presence. <laughs> yes. Clearly. All right. So, so she storms back. She storms out. She goes back home. She's all sad. And Drew, the little brother, is waiting to like ambush her with a Nerf gun or something. When she gets home, he doesn't, right? He's just going to overhear the big conversation she has with mom and dad about what a jackass Stewart is. Okay, but this otherwise dramatic scene is entirely ruined because they're like, I don't know, mom. Will there ever be the right boy for me? And in the meanwhile, Drew is doing fucking dive rolls in the <laughs> foreground. <laughs> red Bravo 7, Red Bravo 7. <laughs> They're like, we want it to be like real life. Something needs to be happening in the background. Drew, <laughs> run around. Right. <laughs> There's this great moment where dad's like, you know, he, she's like, oh, everything went wrong. And Stuart's marrying somebody else. And the dad goes, well, it sounds like the Lord kept you from a big disaster. And I'm like, you know, this is not the time to talk about how much God is nailing it, bro. Okay. <laughs> Uh, also, can we talk about what the mother says? Oh, please. I mean, we all wrote, we all made notes about this, right? Okay. Can I just read? This is exactly what this person says to her daughter. <laughs> See if you can detect when she has a stroke. Okay, yeah. Okay. Here. And you, our, our listeners, see if you can decipher what it is she means here. Perhaps you can write in and let us know. My mama used to say, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. What? What the fuck? It doesn't what? mean anything. <laughs> what the fuck are you saying? And then I literally went and looked it up. It's Proverbs thirteen twelve, And I did say, uh, of course, only the King James is the one with that translation. What does that tell you? I won't go there. Mm -hmm. The rest, <laughs> it, it basically says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Right. That's that would be a, a somewhat normal way to say it. Right. It's, that, that at least like makes sense internally, even if it's grammatically. Not, right. Use, yes. Right. Grammatically. I think she just didn't know the lines again. Back to the pacing. Yeah. I think she didn't know the line. <laughs> right. And I think they were just like, fuck it, dude. Just just who, who gives a fuck? Nobody knows. Anything. Just keep rolling. Nobody's going to know that that verse anyway. And then how about this for some shitty parenting? Mom is like, well, I know you're terribly upset and you feel like your life is ruined. Let's all go play Parcheesi or something. And she's like, all right, all right fine. Yeah, she's like, okay. Uh <laughs> it's like she's on house so, arrest. Right. It's yep. basically. So they literally go to play life, a board game all about getting married where the winner is the person that <laughs> dies first. <laughs> Jesus, of all the games that you could play, what was the little, what was the one in the mall about dating that they had back in the 80s? Maybe that Mystery one would be worse. Date, yeah. yeah, but Jesus Christ. How do you know that? I don't even know what you're talking about. I have you didn't play fucking... Mystery Day? No. I'll... Oh, you missed out. I don't know that you know this, Eli. You may not know this. Did we talk about the fact that I was raised in a Christian cult? No. <laughs> Oh, yes. Uh, that's why I was so fucking excited to talk about this movie. Fuck yeah. And also, I moved 
to North Carolina when I was in seventh grade. I have so much. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Deep seated, like front. Yeah, because this movie front takes place in knowledge about East this. Bend, yeah. East Bend, North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So I wouldn't know that game because it's probably a heathen game. It's probably like it a, is a heathen game. game. I it is absolutely a heathen game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's about having boyfriends and shit. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, okay. Absolutely mm-hmm. not. So they go to play. They, they're, they're playing life. Mom brought cookies. This, More this, cookies. This, this, <laughs> second time. <laughs> second batch of cookies. Second, keep yeah, counting home. Oh, I say I, I wrote my notes. So like the symbols of maternity get uh, keep getting more conspicuous. Eventually, this woman's just going to be a breast wearing an apron, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but sagging, very saggy breasts. Let's be clear. Yeah, yeah exactly. well, of course. Yeah. And lit from behind. <laughs> <laughs> the halo light. Yes. Yeah. So and, and and so she's like playing life and she's like, oh, she lands on the spots like, oh, you know, I get married and have twins or whatever. And then. Drew, the little brother's like, all you girls ever think about is getting married and having kids. And I'm like, dude, it's she's reading from the fucking board. OK, that's what that <laughs> space on the board says. Drew's really unclear about the rule of the game of life. <laughs> and then the middle brother, apropos of nothing, says, Dad, do you believe in soulmates? And dad's like, well, I'd say that's the whole plot of the movie, son. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, son, I sure do. In fact, I believe that soulmates, maybe there's a mix up in heaven sometimes and your your soulmate ends up being your daughter. Okay, you all right, Dad, all right. It's <laughs> great. Moving on. But the, the getting young, getting married young propaganda with the little brother, and he's like, I don't want to get married. And the dad's like, oh, remind me of that in a decade, okay? And they all laugh. Oh, right. He'll be 18 in yes. a decade. Yes. He's not going to get married in a decade, you psychopath. But they so are. They do. Fucking hope not. Yeah, right. Yeah. Jesus. Also, I have to say, I have to say it. She gets the twin sons are born and she collects presents because the movie is about the fact that her only function in life is to breed. Yes. And she's been bred to reproduce by her breeder, who is her father. And they're looking yep. for the right sire, right? It's the whole thing. Yep. The the oh, it's all like you're supposed to have children. He's the one planting the soybeans, damn it. Too heavy yeah. handed. <laughs> 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 so okay, so in the next thing we get, we get dad. He's in the study. He's reading books about how to be a good Christian husband. Mm. And mom says, "Oh, you know, I thought you could use a break. Why don't you read this fucking East Bend shopper that just came in the mail today?" I thought you could use a break. Read different things. <laughs> read coupons, right? Like, like read classified ads. <laughs> to which he replies, and let me just let's just talk about how different our worlds are. <laughs> he replies, just leave it on the desk. Mm. I would not talk to my secretary like that. And the only reason I would talk to my wife like that is I wanted a swift and painful suicide. <laughs> I had decided I was done in this body. <laughs> just leave it on the desk. <laughs> He might as well tip her. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, so she leaves. He starts reading the sales paper and he sees something that gets Drew in trouble. Apparently, Drew has taken out an ad in the fucking Boonville shopper or whatever (laughs) that is trying to find a husband for Grace. Right. It says, I have a girl that makes great mac and cheese. Somebody come get her. (laughs) Right. And again, because this movie doesn't know anything about pacing or plot. The doorbell rings and we are instantly going to have a montage about that joke they just introduced. Yes. And look, (laughs) this is the like the easiest setup in the history of comedy, right? This is the easiest possible. And now just a bunch of, you know, unacceptable guys have to show up. It would be so easy to knock this down. They have the only funny person in all of Christianity, Tori Martin, in this montage. Is that the red haired guy? Yes. That's uh-huh. the red haired guy. Yep. I told, I've said in my notes, he's the best thing in the whole movie. Red haired guy. Oh, yeah. Yep. We, we've seen him in like three or four movies and he is always way too good for whatever dumbass Christian movie he's in. It's really sad. It's really sad. <laughs> Also, like the suitors definitely thought this was a real movie. They thought that this was like their break into Hollywood. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, except Tori Martin, because he's been burned before. But yeah, yeah, we get this montage of unsuitable suitors. And it's fucking incredible because, you know, according to Christian patriarchy, all you need to be to be an acceptable suitor is Christian. Right. Right. 
So this movie can't do any bad version of men. It's just like, I'm a guy wearing sunglasses. <laughs> I have hands. I'm wearing mittens in the summer. Like, it's, it's not, not only is it not comedy beats, it feels like these beats were generated by a random word generator. Yes, right. Right. We made a thought, watch a thousand hours of rom-coms or whatever. Yeah. So, oh, and, and now we're going to cut to Brooke. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, who the fuck is Brooke? Noah, you've forgotten to introduce us to this character. No, I haven't. We have never met Brooke. We will not see Brooke again until act goddamn three when she will suddenly be the plot of the fucking movie. But we see we cut to Brooke, this blonde chick, and she's like, I'm looking for information on a guy named Clint. And we're like, well, we haven't met a guy named Clint, have we? And we're like, well, we met a couple guys that haven't been named yet. I guess maybe we <laughs> I don't fucking maybe know. one of them was Clint. <laughs> was this movie shot in perfect order? What the fuck is happening? <laughs> But I had a, I, I wrote in my notes. I was like, I think she's looking for the doctor guy from early. Ooh. And it turned out I was correct. So I was actually pretty proud of myself for wow, look at that. figuring out look at in that. Yeah, well done. what this scene was about. Also, I would like, again, back to the symbolism. Mm -hmm. The blonde, all, it's, it's obvious. Anyone with blonde hair is a slut. Yes, of course. And this blonde haired slut is has a red phone red lipstick and is wearing black <laughs> eyeliner yes immediately and oh and then she, she literally rubs her hands together like she's a witch <laughs> like right? a it's like, oh, perfect. <laughs> she does. this is a bad guy <laughs> she does rub her hands together like an otter and it's very confusing <laughs> All right, so then Grace goes to see her friend Tessa at some other shitty restaurant or coffee shop or whatever they talk about perfume and, and clothes because they're ladies. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> Jesus. And so Tessa leaves, but she's like, don't worry. I'm sure that the perfect guy for you is right around the corner. And she's like, no, nah, I don't think I'm going to meet him until like act two, probably. But OK. <laughs> so she goes to the counter to order a latte. And wouldn't you know it? The barista is that same guy that was working the counter at that jewelry store that she was in in the first scene. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And now that he's not dressed like Mr. Beaver, she's a total bitch. Yes. <laughs> so he's like, he's like, oh, hey, I remember you. And she's like, could you could you fucking not? Could you just give me a goddamn coffee? And he's like, nope, I sure can't. No, I can't. This movie was <laughs> written by Christians. <laughs> incapable of not And so this behavior will be terrifying and never be addressed. No, nope, not really. <laughs> he chases her in their meet cute. He chases <laughs> her into the parking lot yes and surprises her as she's unlocking her car stalker. yes oh yeah total stalker it's terrifying also i'd like to point out this guy is clearly almost 40 but yet trying to i think act like he's in his late 20s maybe early 30s yeah uh, mid 20s yeah. something like that mm -hmm. yeah and i would like to point out that so begins the idea that men with thinning hair are the bad guys. Oh, interesting. Ooh, yeah. interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, you're I think you're right, because I can come up with two other examples from this yep. movie yep. alone. You're right. Blonde and thin hair are the bad guys. Yep, exactly. And, also, and there's really, one character who has both, so yeah. <laughs> when she says, thank you for reminding me of the most horrible day of my life, I laughed so <laughs> It was the most. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's right. That that's plot. as bad as it's got. Okay, would you would you just wait, girl? <laughs> also, it's not like he knows about that, right? Right. They're talking. He's like, "Oh, I remember. I saw you at the ring shop." And she's like, "Well, if you'd been watching the movie," and he's like, "What? <laughs> <laughs> you would know? That's the day my boyfriend broke up with me." So yeah, so he chases her around until she eventually gives him her number. Remember, guys, just keep asking, and eventually they'll say yes, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah. OK, so the, the next morning we get Grace breakfasting with the family. This is where we learn that she's taking an interior design course. But we're like, this is barely ever going to come up. So we never really have any sense of what is this some sort of online certificate she's trying to get? Is this community college thing? We don't know. I love that you said because she studies lady stuff. It's lady stuff. <laughs> we, we know that she does lady stuff. Her Stewart went to college for real stuff. But yeah. And dad comes in and he's like, 
hey, you know, we got a new neighbor. Maybe we should all pack into the truck together and bring him a pie. And and they're like, oh, is it 1950 fucking two? Yeah. And the mom's like, I'll make a pie <laughs> yes. immediately. Yes. yes. She says, I'll whip up a pie. Who the fuck can whip up a pie? <laughs> I'll whip up a pie in my softly diffused kitchen. <laughs> with the ambiguously <laughs> holding the farmhouse coffee cup very awkwardly. Yeah, right. Let me move these cookies out of the way and I'll get to that pie. Yes. That's amazing. It's four fucking cookies and a pie, right? That's mm-hmm. yeah. So, so it's, it's more. It's much pies. closer to it's, a one it's and four three cookies and two pies. If we're just talking baked goods <laughs> in general on the ratio. Also, Grace is supposed to be working on said design project, and that's supposed to be fifty percent mm-hmm. of her grade. Her mother volunteers to bake this pie, and immediately Grace is like, "I'll help you bake." Right? Mm-hmm. Not, I'm going to work on my project. That's fifty percent of my grade. I'll just fucking bake a pie with you. And also, I'll go with you to say hi to the new neighbor, right? She's got plenty of fucking time. Yeah. 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 So they go greet the new neighbor. This is the handsome doctor guy that was burying the ring at the beginning. And the it's 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 fucking white people neighbor talk right it is oh my god this dialogue comes with a do not apparate heavy machinery (laughs) warning but also also the guy opens the door and the dad doesn't say hello he just he's just greets him with his name it's like was this pre-arranged or was this impromptu like what what's happening or did you show up with your family of five you (laughs) fucking psycho (laughs) hi we're gonna sit in your living room i was gonna ask the north carolinian is this a thing that they do it is a thing. It actually is a thing, actually. Oh, God. I'm glad to know. I, I, I moved to this small town in Georgia. If anybody had showed up at my house with fucking three kids and a pie, I'd have shot them in the fucking <laughs> driveway or something. Legally, like too. Legally. Be, it wouldn't be unheard of. Yeah, right. Right. It would only be, I'd only be the third guy that week. Yeah. So, and then... They talk with the doctor and they're like, oh, you should come to our church. And he's like, I would love to come to your church. And I'm like, oh, there's the man for her. Right. <laughs> yeah. And they immediately assume he goes to church. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's not. Are you Christian or are you a churchgoer or whatever? It's you should go to our church. I really don't care what religion you are. You should we'd, go to we'd our- like to declare dibs on you, religiously speaking. Yeah, no, that's great. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, OK, so they leave sometime later. She comes into the study. Grace does to talk to dad about that barista that she met a couple scenes ago. Right. And, and dad, by the way, he's dad is a farmer. You can always tell he's working hard because he's constantly using an adding machine. <laughs> so yep. A lot of farming <laughs> includes adding up long columns of numbers. This movie has no fucking clue what farming is. Dad will be holding like a scythe <laughs> and a hacksaw <laughs> at various points, just like clanking them together over a dead cow's corpse. <laughs> like there's no, if you learned your farm stuff from like my son's puzzles, <laughs> that's how you would write this movie. <laughs> Just gently fitting in the cow into a wooden space. Yeah. The cow does go moo. I'm a farmer. So dad's like, she's like, I met this guy and, and he you know chased me into the parking lot. He was very romantic about it. And dad's like, mm, I'd like to meet him. And again, I wrote in my nose. How the fuck old is she supposed to be? How old is she? <laughs> Great question. Great question. And also, he's so creepy when she's like, and he was really nice and helped me out. And he's like, I bet he did in this, like, this creepy way. Right. It's like, what are you implying? Yeah. Man? Right. This incest porn won't start fucking and it's very upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> he just keeps opening the pizza box and there's pizza in there. Yeah, I'm right? very confused. <laughs> so, so, and then there's a ring at the doorbell and she goes to answer it. And wouldn't you know it, it's another guy responding to that ad which we will from this point on forget about and will no longer be part of the movie he might as well be winded and be like sorry I'm from the montage <laughs> earlier <laughs> I know my jokes doesn't make a lot of sense but yeah this is where she finds out about the thing and then she runs after the brother with the whole like you know Drew I'm gonna get you and then everybody laughs like the end of a fucking Scooby Doo episode oh uh... mm-hmm and then you and then you realize well actually you don't realize which is helpful you don't realize how much longer you have to go how much more so movie much longer. there is so much to more go. i am always aware of that <laughs> <laughs> so okay so wait so dad heads into the barn he's gonna wave some tools at a tractor right oh my god I, let me just talk about this out of the front 
because I feel like a fucking crazy person. Throughout the entire movie, dad will be like, my combine is broken. <laughs> and he will just gently rest his hand on the combine and just one out of three scenes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And be like, nope, still broken. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But then, okay. The bad guy shows up. Now, we have not met this character yet, but we know he's the bad guy. I mean, now we know because the thinning hair, right? Because because right, fucking right. Amy cracked Clearly the code. <laughs> he's got blonde thinning hair, no less. Exactly. <laughs> but I knew he was the bad guy right away because he's wearing a suit in a barn, right? Nobody in the history of films who wasn't a bad guy ever wore a suit in a barn. No. Right. And let's talk about what they're going for and let's talk about what happens, yes, right? Because what they're going for is, hello, I'm Mr. Fancyman of Fancyman's Real Estate and I'm here to tell you that you're poor and I want to buy your land and turn it into homosexuals. <laughs> and he's supposed to be like, Uncle Sam, but your name at the top of his list. Yes, right? Uh, yes, right, right. <laughs> okay, but the people who made this movie can't write. So instead he's like, hi, I'm a real estate agent. I heard that this was like under debt. Would you be interested in selling it? And he's like, get the fuck out of my land, Fraser Crane. (laughs) Also, also, his name is Nigel Living Good. Living Good. Come on. (laughs) My name is Throckbottom (laughs) Trans Rights or Human Rights. (laughs) Pilly Wisher, (laughs) the seventh. Oh, I definitely should have peed before we recorded this. Oh, (laughs) Nigel Living Good. All right, well, I'll tell you what, this movie has a villain, and I'm pretty sure they think that means it's a plot. So with that bit of assurance, we're going to pause for a quick break. But we'll be back with even more Princess Cut. Hi, I'm Amy Lynn Stewart. And as a busy mother, I know a thing or two about picky eaters. The unsleeping one is all the sustenance that I need. That's right. If the unsleeping one has shown his face to your children, you know that they no longer require rest nor food and they can't feel pain. I hear his voice eternally. But no matter what kind of picky eater you have at home, there's no better solution than HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Well, there is an America. That's right, Billy. And if your escape through the countryside from a cult of robed cultists has your weeknights packed, HelloFresh is here to make your hectic fall weeknights a little easier and a lot more delicious. Their quick and easy meals, including 20-minute meals, low prep, and easy cleanup options, take the stress out of mealtime with time-saving, no-fuss recipes ready in a snap. He has clawed open time and brought through the nothing that came before. And HelloFresh isn't just for dinners. Shop HelloFresh Market for quick breakfasts, wholesome snacks, and even desserts. You'll find everything you need to satisfy your cravings without stepping foot in the grocery store or mini mart. It's true. I was a HelloFresh customer even before they became a sponsor. They make weeknight cooking a breeze, and I ended up keeping a bunch of recipes to make even on the weeks when HelloFresh doesn't send me the ingredients. Eli, what are you doing here? I'm here for the child. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Awful16 and use code Awful16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and... Three free gifts. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Awful16 and use code Awful16 for 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. HelloFresh. The blind shall count themselves the lucky ones. I don't think that's their catchphrase, honey. Someday it shall be all catchphrases. Okay. Hello? Is this the Daily Ledger personal section? Why, yes, it is. Can I help you? I'd like to place an ad for my sister. Your sister, eh? Hey, you sound a little young. How old are you? Eight. Teen, 18. All right. Wait, 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 what would you like this ad to say? Um, One sister makes good mac and cheese. Come get her or something. Whatever boys do. Whatever boys do. Got it. And just to be clear, you, you have the $11 to post this thing, right? Um... 
Do you take piggy banks? Kid, this is print media at this point. You can pay me in a five minute phone call with my ex wife. What? Why doesn't your ex wife want? I don't talk- want to talk about it. Okay. And we're back for more of this shit, and we're going to rejoin the action on Jared the Stalker. This is the barista guy that chased her out to the parking lot. He shows up at her house. She has not told him where she lives. Oh. Right? She asks him. He opens the fucking door, and she's like, how the fuck did you know where I live? And he's like, oh, I I found you online. Yeah. Stalker. Yeah. Yeah. Stalker. Yeah, like. I found you online is like how you hit up someone on Instagram. It's not how you show up to their home. Right. I my notes. Jared's going to murder you and wear you like a skin suit, Grace. This guy is a walking red flag. He's nothing but red flags. And notice how they the, the bad guy is like the hipster who's like making an attempt to be fashionable and have like a yes. normal haircut. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. The guy without conservative clothes and hair. Yeah. So she's like, well, you know what? Since you're stalking me so well anyway, I might as well introduce you to my dad. <laughs> and so they go in and this is, I, I love Jared so much in this moment. Mostly I hate Jared, but I love him so much right here because she's like, the dad's like, why don't you sit down and we can get to know you? And he's like, oh, that sounds awful. No. No, that sounds gross. <laughs> <laughs> so that you can establish sexual possession over your daughter. No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> He's like, no, I was going to take your daughter out. I don't want to talk to you. And, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, go, Jared. So they go out for shakes. And the dad says, don't be out late. And first of all, it's it's fucking 2.30 p.m. Yeah. Based on like, you know, the sun. Yeah. It's the afternoon. Yes. Don't be out late. I think he's like being like, don't be late for dinner. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. But he's like, don't be. And also like. How the fuck old is she? How old is she? How old is she? Because I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. If she's young enough to be told not to be home too late, Jared is way too old for her. Yep. Is that man? Jared is a pedophile. Yes, exactly. Jared is 65 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So he takes her to the fucking shake shop or whatever. And they have like, nobody cares exposition like that like the writer knew that they, they had to have conversation about stuff so he starts talking about his family which will never in any way factor into the story except just to say that anybody who comes from a problematic home is a stalker right yes right? it's a bad like, person right right is a bad person yeah. yeah i guess you could say my parents never brought me to church that's why i'm a rapist yeah <laughs> anyways <laughs> Right. And she's like, well, do you ever plan on settling down? He's like, I'm more of a Heath, actually. Um, Don't like labels. Okay. The only realistic (laughs) moment he has in this movie is she's like, so do you think you're going to settle down? And he's like, oh, she looks bad. Maybe. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Amy. Heath is our co-host. I was making fun of him quick while he was gone. Oh, okay. So, like, yeah. He's incapable of love. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. And of course, so eventually the movie gets as bored with this dialogue as we are, and this just devolves into this farm loving montage. Oh yep. God, the montage. <laughs> yeah, imagine a courtship montage without any affection. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, there's hand holding, but no kissing. No kissing. And it's not just that there's no kissing, it's that he tries and she's like, oh, no, 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 no. oh my God, what are you doing? This is going way, way too fast for me. Right. And look, consent, awesome. Yes, get consent for everything. We're all pro that. But I feel like the answer that Jeremy doesn't seem to understand is not to just keep trying to kiss someone. <laughs> <laughs> Right. She's not on a secret timer, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> also, like her leaning against like the glamour shot mall shot of her leaning against the huge bale of hay. Yes. Oh, so which, good. as we all know, would be deeply uncomfortable. And then the whipped cream coffee shot. It's like a close up almost of whipped cream. Yes. Coffee like. Yeah, clearly virgins who live out in the country drink Starbucks whipped cream. And that's how, you know, they're a virgin. Yeah. Genuinely, like if you told me that like a prepubescent little girl (laughs) wrote this movie, so much more of it makes sense. Yes. 
is. Well, the only way that doesn't make sense is that there's no way a girl wrote this fucking movie, right? A prepubescent right. boy might maybe, but yeah. Oh, it's some dude. It's so, definitely some dude who thinks that, oh, girls must be like this. Yes, exactly. His, he put he gave his wife a writing credit on it as well, but I don't I don't believe him. No, that was just sort of bringing him cookies every <laughs> six seconds. Leave him on my desk. Leave him on my yeah. desk. So, <laughs> just the check. So, but this montage opens or ends up rather with them pulling up at his place, and it's raining outside. And by raining, you mean there's a hose. <laughs> on top of the car with yes. water running down the window. Hey, credit to whatever guy, whatever, whoever's <laughs> cousin was the hose holding guy. Because they were like, right, so you simulate rain by you spraying the hose on it. And he just like full force fucking power wash the side yes. of the window <laughs> facing the car so that they're either in hurricane fucking Sandy or a badly teched movie. Yes. <laughs> <So> <sighs> So they pull up at his house and she has this real, like, wow, sure is a, a shithole, like kind of a moment. Right. <laughs> and then he goes in for the kiss again. Yes. Right. And at this point, she's already told him. No, now we're supposed to believe that some time has gone by. Right. This isn't the same day they've been dating for a while now. See montage. Yes. Right. Yes, exactly. Exactly. But she's still not ready for that. Yeah. She goes, not till you put a ring on it. Princess cut. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Uh, the name of the movie. Oh, that's right. She says, Prince, there it is. She says it there once. There's through line, you guys. Once per act. Come on, you were giving them a hard time. Yeah. She <laughs> says it in the third act as well. Yeah, but this is the first time in the in the movie where we, where, like we as the audience had to cope with the fact that like what this movie is saying is that you can't kiss until you're married. Until you're married. married. What the fuck? Your first kiss should be the and you may now kiss the bride kiss is what they're saying. No, that's a worldview so fucking insane that we made a reality show about it. We literally <laughs> just follow these fucking freaks around and we watch them smash their faces together for the first time. And then we put it on TLC to sell shampoo. That's how bad an idea it is. <laughs> If the, if your worldview is a reality show to 98% of the planet, it's a bad worldview. <laughs> so, yeah. So immediately after trying to plant a kiss that she's already told him she doesn't want on her, he's like, well, why don't you come inside? I promise I won't try anything. And I'm just like, I don't fucking believe you, man. If you weren't going to try anything, why would that ominous thunderclap come just as she got out of the car. <laughs> Why would Jesus be standing just out of frame in the rain <laughs> shaking his head vigorously? No. Also, I mean, this guy must be desperate. Like, he must be desperate to be trying to lure this one girl in there. I just, I cannot admit, like, if once, once you tell me, oh, well, we can't kiss until we get married, I'm gone. I would be just, what... <laughs> Yeah. If you told me we can't kiss until we're married, I would eject myself from the car like we had been in a frontline crash. <laughs> I would have exited through the windshield like sunny goddamn Bono's son. <laughs> so, so she goes inside with him and she leaves her phone in the car for some fucking reason and immediately mom tries to call her and can't get a hold of her. Yeah. Mm. So we, we cut to mom and dad. Dad tells mom about the evil real estate developer guy, right? She's uh -huh. like, he he offered me a reasonable price for this land. And mom's like, how dare he? This fam <laughs> this has been in your family for generations. It's like, I know. Yeah. Do you think he'll ever come back into the movie? No, <laughs> no, I will never. That'll be literally the last we ever see of him. <laughs> <laughs> but so mom tries to call her again. It's been like two minutes after all. So mom tries to call Grace again and still she's not answering her phone. She's like, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't know why, but my heart is telling me that she's drying off with a metrosexual right now. And I just, I don't like it. I don't like it. So, okay. So, but just then his car pulls up and Grace comes running in through the rain to come home. Now, let me clarify something for the audience. She is so traumatized when she walks in that for the remaining third of the movie, until I re-went over it and realized what actually happened, I thought that he had sexually assaulted her. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not what happened. Or that should they, maybe they had actually had sex. Right. Or that they had sex. Nope. They kissed. Yes. What happened is 
They kissed, and she's in the third act of the fucking crying game as a result. <laughs> so she storms up to her room, and she calls her friend Tessa, and she's like, I kissed him. I don't know what to do. I feel like such a whore. Right? <laughs> And Tessa actually has good advice. She's like, oh, you feel like a whore because you kissed someone consensually. Have you considered going to therapy? Yeah, right. <laughs> but the blonde slut yep. is suggesting therapy, right? Oh, yeah. Therapy is always evil in Christian movies, right? Because oh, it's an alternative oh, to Christianity, right? Oh, yeah. And her derisive, like, your mom has a therapist, like, Oh my God, what? Gross. <laughs> I mean, I guess. Yeah. The Chris, what, what's wrong with her? Is she dying? <laughs> <laughs> and then she tells her, no, 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 it's fine. The first session's free, you know, just like a heroin dealer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That's how they get you hooked on better help online therapy. <laughs> so. So then we cut to my best worst. I'm so happy. We cut to like Dr. Ruth without the accent, right? Dude. <laughs> yeah. This this is my favorite scene in the movie for two reasons. First of all, because as a fellow character actor and actress, Amy, we have lots of notes for this woman's performance. <laughs> but two, we get to see what these people think a Jew is. Which is so exciting. <laughs> They're just like, what are them Jews like? They got plants. They wear them fancy. What are those fancy mirrors they put in front of them faces as glasses? Yeah, they wear them. <laughs> and some pleather leopard print jacket. <laughs> yes. Mm. I mean, the therapist is wearing a pleather <laughs> leopard print jacket and chewing gum. I just yeah, want to point it out. Thing. The, yeah, like, obnoxiously chewing gum. And this movie learned everything it knows about psychiatry from fucking Peanuts comics, right? She holds out her little tin can. She puts in the nickel and she's like, what's troubling you, dear? <laughs> yeah, she opens with what's trouble. Can I just say, I know we have some therapists who listen to our show. Please open your first session with your new clients with what's troubling you, dear. <laughs> I just want to see what rabbit holes that leads you down. <laughs> So, yeah, she's like, so I've got this boyfriend and he always wants to, in her own fucking words, always wants to hug and kiss and stuff. And the fucking psychiatrist is like, how the fuck old is your character? How Which, old are, are you? In you? Your <laughs> <laughs> she's like, oh, I see. You are trapped in your parents' farm and your dad is planning on making you a sister wife. I see. I've got to help you get out of here. Right. Well, so and then Dr. Ruth it's just like, what you need is some dick. What you're going to need is some yeah. long, hard, thrusting <laughs> penis. Is yeah. what you're going to need. Seems like you need some cock to me. You seem like you want some cock and you don't have any cock. Have you considered some fucking cock? <laughs> and it seems like this Jared guy's got a cock that he would happily give you. <laughs> She's just eating a big sloppy meatball slump while she says it. Don't like you need to get fucked. You know there's no God, right? They like just they just turn right off when we die. Nothing but the dark. <laughs> I'll fuck him. You want to watch me fuck him? They're like oh warm up. Oh, I love this scene so fucking. She says, "What you need is a practice marriage." That's the actual line they gave this woman to fucking say. I know. A practice marriage. <laughs> a starter marriage. No, starter no, that's marriage. It. You're, oh, you're yeah. right. A starter, starter marriage. marriage. Before you move oh, on to but the... It's, no, she's, she's attempting an accent. She's attempting like a New York accent. Isn't yes, she? right. She's trying. She's going for Jew. Jew. Yes. She definitely going is going for, for Jew. Jew. Oh, my God. I've watched a lot of people go for Jew in my life. And this... <laughs> not the most successful attempt I've seen. Let me throw it out there. <laughs> Honestly, when she storms out of the office, I really expected this woman to pick up the phone and be like, sorry, I had a client. Now, back to planning 9-11. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right. So we head back home, and this is maybe the most useless goddamn scene in the whole fucking movie, right? Oh, my God. This, uh, this scene is like a kid's make-a-wish was to put a seat in the movie, and they were like, fuck, we, to we told him he could write one scene, but we have to instantly undo it the minute anything happens. Right, yeah. Uh -huh. 
So, okay, so Grace is back home. She's doing her big fucking scrapbooking assignment that's 50% of her interior design grade. In the middle of the kitchen, the small kitchen, uh, again, inappropriate locations right. throughout. With a big ass glass of tea sitting right next to it. Right. right? This is North Carolina. I'm assuming that's tea. Uh huh. And so the little brother comes by and he accidentally knocks the full glass of tea on her assignment and just ruins it. Mm hmm. Now, not for nothing. The assignment looks like something I could recreate in 15 fucking minutes, right? If I had a wet one, I could give you a dry one of these pretty fucking quick. And also kind of her fault for having her fucking tea set next, right, right next to an assignment that would be ruined by having tea dumped on it. But she turns to the brother and she goes, sometimes I wish you weren't even my brother. And that cuts him to the fucking bone. Oh, what I love is that because these people aren't human and they've never actually <laughs> felt emotions, the movie turns to us. and is like, yeah, that got pretty real. What do you think? And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Wow. I've said like worse stuff to my mom as a joke. Man, this <laughs> is right. It's crazy movie. Also, I would like to note the evil schoolwork made her be evil to her brother. Ooh. Oh, it's probably Ooh. because she was doing schoolwork. Yep. If that lady hadn't been trying to get educated. Right. Has she been baking cookies with her mother like she should have been? Or sewing. She could have been doing some sewing. <laughs> yeah. So so the brother runs off. She follows. I wanted it to be because she wasn't done yelling at him. <laughs> Side tackles him, starts to punch him. Come on, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and as she runs outside, she passes dad chatting with the neighbor doctor guy in the driveway, right? Yeah. What is he doing there? It the nuts never explained. Nope. No. He's just he needs to be there he's just conveniently. There hanging out. That's how the <laughs> make a wish kid wrote it, I guess. So he's, he's there with dad's <laughs> Viagra prescription. <laughs> yeah, right. For when the moment's right. So <laughs> but as he's driving up, the doctor goes to leave and he hears Grace scream. So he he grabs his doctor bag and he runs. Now I love how underplayed this scene is because Drew apparently got hit by a car while he was running away, all sad because of what his sister said. And the doctor runs there and we're like, oh, okay, so the doctor's here to help. But but Drew isn't hurt. Drew is 100% fine. Right. <laughs> They're just, they, the doctor comes in and he's just like, does it hurt when I do this? He's like, it doesn't hurt when anything happens. So he goes, oh, okay, well then the fuck was the point of this scene then? The what whole, was the point, the of, point this of this scene? scene? Did your grandpa just want to run over your bike and we decided to catch it on <laughs> film? What the fuck is happening? <laughs> the whole scene is about the doctor in his 30s being turned on by the immature girl running away and crying and realizing, yeah. oh, I'm going to fuck that. Yes. No, you're right. Yeah. But how old is she? Right. She, she like she's like she has the emotional maturity of a, a middle school girl. Right. Yeah. Of a five year old. Yeah. 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 So okay. So she harumphs back home. <laughs> she harumphs back. Home. So so she goes upstairs. She's she's gonna lay down and and get all cry or whatever. The movie has entirely forgotten about the big assignment at this point. Oh, uh, remember sobbing face down in your bed? Yeah. Good <laughs> <The> times. <laughs> Poor Eli. So, but mom followers are upstairs. She's pillow crying. And mom's like, I think this is uh, about right time for the mom daughter scene. And she's like, yeah, you're, you're probably right. <laughs> Cause it, this is where she has to tearfully admit to her mom that things have gotten pretty physical between her and Jared. And just as mom's going like, Oh really? Tell me all the details. She's like, okay, <laughs> thank you. We have, we have to talk about mom's choice. Oh, mom is, oh my God. Mom is aiming for a surprise gesture here. And so she places her hand upon her breast. Yes. Right. As it, as in a shocked gesture. But then in perhaps the third worst acting choice I've ever seen, she slowly traces her right hand over to her left breast while her daughter is talking in the creepiest thing since fucking Matthew McConaughey and Killer Joe. <laughs> She's like, you've been kissing. <laughs> Mm, tell mommy all about it. <laughs> right. So she and, and eventually she just admits that no, it was just I we kissed and and hugged and hugged like face on hug, not a side hug. I'm talking about a full on hug. And mom's like, oh, well, I love you even if you did kiss Jared. Now let's go talk to your dad about that because he has man wisdom. <laughs> Yeah, I must take you to your master now. I'm yeah, not right. allowed to counsel you. I must take you to the man. 
<laughs> That's why I only have 16 lines. Yeah, understand? right, right. I have more cookies than lines. Yeah. Honestly, if let me just say, this would be my favorite movie if while she was talking to her, she just like gone over to a cabinet and pulled out a hot tray of cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I put these in here earlier. So, okay. So, but then she goes out to chat with dad, you know, because of the man wisdom. And this is another example of them trying to capture exterior audio on a windy day. So that's nice again. Uh. Right. And of course, once again, she opens this wrong. She's like, well, you know, dad, he pushed our relationship to be much more physical than I know is right. And dad is just like, oh, so, uh, butt, uh, your butt stuff, right? You're talking about butt stuff. And he's like, she's like, no, I kissing. He's like, oh. Yeah, diagramming the consent in that sentence, it's like, he pushed our relationship. And it's like, okay, that's not good. To be physical, okay, that doesn't matter. More than God wants. And it's like, that also, okay, so we got two doesn't matters and one do. It's like, how do we chart this? <laughs> I don't know the math on this one. But dad explains to her, look, this is my fault. It's my fault. I let you have way too much free will. Yes. Here is a <laughs> packet of soybeans. I made a little craft project. <laughs> Soybeans. <laughs> These soybeans, I put a bunch of torn up paper in there with words on them. Words like perseverance and stuff. So good words, like long yeah. words. <laughs> These soybeans are your vagina. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck was going on with any of this scene? Uh, yeah, she has a moment where she's like, Are you going to arrange a marriage? And they laugh at her, but like, that's a valid question right. with these fucking weirdos. That is a valid question. No, the movie felt the need to clarify that he wasn't talking about an arranged <laughs> marriage. Yeah, they lost some viewers at that moment, right? There were people who were on for the ride of this movie and were like, well, see, there's your problem right there. A bunch of liberals refuse to arrange a marriage. Yeah. <laughs> and she goes, at the very end of this scene, she's like, well, but dad, what do I do about Jared? And he goes, I think you already know. I'm like, wait, what? What is it? What does she know? We all thought he meant kill him, yes. right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, wait, where does she say? Because I have written in my notes that she says, Daddy, I do, I do. And then hugs him <laughs> with the mom <laughs> sitting next to her. Yeah. And I'm like, I write, what's happening? What's um, happening? Mm -hmm. It's like, I feel like sister wife. I feel yes. like, I do, Daddy. I'm going to marry you. And the mom's <laughs> like, Yes, and I'm going to watch. <laughs> and I'll bake all the cookies you need. <laughs> also, I have a theory. I don't think, I think the kids are adopted, and I don't think the dad and mom have ever actually had sex. Oh, no, interesting. They're not ready. They're not ready. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to push her farther than she's ready to take this. He, he's saying yeah. he wants the daughter. He, ha he needs the daughter. Yeah. 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 Very Woody Allen vibe here. So, okay. <laughs> and then this is so fucking amazing. We cut her. She's leaving the library. She's gone and picked up some books about, you know, godly relationships or whatever. She's walking out of the library with, I'm going to say conservatively 13 books. She has an art. She's like Gus Gus the mouse with books. <laughs> <laughs> but Jared sees her walking out with her. 137 fucking volumes of how not to fuck by Jesus <laughs> and he chases her down and he's like hey I've been calling you for a week and you haven't been answering do you want to go off and and fuck wait <laughs> what does he say though what does he say do you want to go to our spot what yes our yes. special spot <laughs> special spot <laughs> <laughs> it's like you want to go park yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. You want to go to make out point? I'm 50. I'm 55. <laughs> I you get wanna, Medicaid. You want to go hug and kiss the like, No, no. I think I think we're unequally yoked. Right. And he goes, "What the fuck does that mean?" She says, "It means I'm breaking up with you." It's not a very sensible. Right. And again, because this movie is written by like a nine year old who saw a fucking Twilight movie from underneath her grandmother's bed, <laughs> he ends the conversation by saying, I can play this charade. <laughs> and we now watch her do like a research slash scrapbooking montage on sexual purity. So, yes, yes, listener, we watch a reading montage. 
Mm -hmm. We watch a montage of someone reading books and this poor actress, because she's not a bad actress, right? I mean, she's not a good actress. No, no, she's not a good one, but she's not like by, by, the, no, by the standards right, right. we've by come to expect of some god awful movies. Yes, exactly. True. She's pretty damn good. And so this poor woman had, to, they were like, okay, so we'll just have a montage of you reading. And so she has to find like seven or eight different ways to read. Yep. At one point, she's like, pace reading do you have you guys hanging ever... backwards over the bed right <laughs> we also see her notes quote unquote on this at one point and her notes are in like fun bubble font like the yes. the fucking list that you'd make to list everyone in the cheerleading squad oh she's got hearts over the yeah, eyes like flowers. She... there's like yes. flowers yes how old is she how old is she <laughs> how old is she <laughs> And then we have to add the, I think, laziest and stupidest and most useless plot point in this entire fucking movie, right? Oh, so God. We cut to Tessa, the best friend from earlier. She's walking into the coffee shop just as the doctor's walking out. They literally bump into each other. <laughs> okay. Well, wait. I Because these actors are not great at bumping. <laughs> no. Okay. They get within 11 feet of each other. They both do a pirouette and they're like, that counts. All right. Yep. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Right. And Tess immediately texts Grace and she says, hey, I just fell in love with some guy that was walking out of the coffee shop. If he becomes your love interest, you and I shall be in conflict. Right. <laughs> Dibs on his penis, which which means we have to assume that Tess texts all of her female friends whenever she has any sexual interest in anyone. Just like I saw. I saw another one today. Dibs. Dibs. <laughs> And Grace is like, that's fine. I'm not even looking for a penis. Yeah, what does she say? I'm waiting on God for the next yes, one. Right. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's not forget that sentient <laughs> line. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, okay. And so sometime later, we get the hot doctor. He's coming over to their house to check on Drew, right? Yeah. And again, this movie's so badly written. He's like, I just came by to check on Drew. And she's like, he's still fine. Remember, he was fine when you checked on him the first time. Nothing happened. So he's like, right. I'm here because this next scene has dialogue with me in it. I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> when he walks up and she turns around, does she not say I had my headphones in? And it's like, we, yeah, yes, we see that you have you your just, fucking you just, your you're pulling your headphones out what of your ears saying? as you said that. I have my headphones in. It's like, that's for our target audience, all the yeah, 80 Right, yeah, what was in her ears? <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so we, we cut to dad and the boys finishing up some farmy stuff. They still can't get that damn combine working. Right. Right. So they're going to have to combine by hand. I don't even know what a fucking combine does. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, he, he goes, we have a banner crop this year. First of all, no, they don't. We literally watched them talk about how bad the crop was yep. earlier mm -hmm. in the movie. But his suggestion is that the three of them are going to pick an entire soybean crop by, <laughs> by hand. hand. Yes. The three of them. Oh, but mom and mom and sis are going to help, too. Oh, yeah. The women. Quote unquote. Yeah. It is almost impossible for me to communicate to all of you either how small that soybean crop <laughs> has to be for that to be possible or how insane a proposition that is. <laughs> well, boys, now that the combine's broken, it looks like we're going to have to dig all the gold out of the ground with our fingernails. <laughs> <laughs> You guys start on the left, I'll start on the right, and then we'll use these Dixie straws in case we hit oil. Right. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ, he's like, but if you help me out with the crop and we do a good enough job, I'll host a trap shooting competition. Oh, my God. Why didn't you say so in the first place? Right? Yes. Like, we, finally, we have something to look forward to in this movie. <laughs> Also, was he implying that his children wouldn't help him if he didn't set up the device they own? Yeah, right. Yeah. So, uh, by the way, trap shooting is uh, apparently it's a type of clay pigeon shooting, not to be confused with skeet shooting or oh, it's snorting. Not. It's not. It's a different type of skeet uh, of uh, 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 clay pigeon shooting. It is actually, by definition, easier skeet shooting. Oh, like, is it? If you can't <laughs> skeet shoot. They're like, oh, okay, well, how about we make them three times the size and twice as close? And you're like, ah, I like that. That's good. <laughs> it is the bowling with bumpers of skeet shooting. 
So, but just then the doc shows up and he's like, hey, we're going about to do an impossible amount of soybean picking. And he's like, hey, I'm in. I'm in. Yeah, because he does he has nothing better to do. We've never seen this doctor practice medicine once. No. He's just always free. Later in the movie, he will declare that he has given up a week of doctoring to help with the soybean. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just wanted it to flash cut to some little old lady in the waiting room, just very clearly dead. <laughs> so, all right. So then we get Doc with mom and dad asking for their permission to fuck their daughter. This is the craziest conversation I have witnessed in our movies in a really long time. Wow, that's saying a lot. It's so fucking uncomfortable. He says, I'm seeking your approval to pursue her. And I wrote in my notes, this guy slash the warrant on Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this movie is all happy about this, but this is some despicable shit, right? This guy's like, before we go to all the you know, technicalities like her permission, everything. I want to make sure it was okay with you if I have sex with your daughter. Yeah. yeah. Before I have a second conversation with your daughter, I just want to make sure that you own her and I can borrow her for a second. Yeah. Right. And then the dad's like, thank you. Thank you for coming to us first. Why the fuck? Why is he coming Why? to you first? That's insane. <laughs> right. And then the dad gets all weepy. He starts yeah, crying. It's crying. I because get he knows it. I get he's it. not going to be able to fuck her. Or he yeah. wanted to fuck her first. Right. Nobody, yeah. nobody yeah. likes sloppy seconds. He's like, Jesus. no, it's cool. Someone besides me should fuck. My God. Oh God. <laughs> I said I wasn't going to cry. It's fine. It's no. fine. Will you um videotape it for Jesus? Also, pacing. I would just like to bring our attention back to the pacing. I think this scene was especially problematic in terms of memorization. They must have really had a hard time here yeah. because you could have driven like 10,000 fucking trains through every pause. Yes. Here's my guess. My guess is that there was a barking dog dying in the background <laughs> and they were just trying to talk around it. Okay. it like, arr, 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 arr. So anyways, I would arr, 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 arr. <laughs> Really love <laughs> if your daughter. Oh! <laughs> so, so, okay. So then he's going to go see to the technicality of asking. Now that he's got dad's permission, he goes out to the dock where Grace is hanging out. And I had to, I had to write this out because of just how fucking insane this line is. Okay. This is his opening line. Once he sits down with her quote, I've really enjoyed getting to know your family over the last few months and getting to know you. I'd like to get to know you better. Would you consider exploring a deeper friendship with me? I mean, a relationship where we'd both be prayerfully considering the possibility of marriage. I I, I have mean, not seen an English sentence so mangled since like <laughs> a spam message in my Instagram folder. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That is such a weird, creepy fucking thing. But, but she's like, yeah, no, I will. It, it's assuming that my dad you know, permits you to do that. I mean, obviously. And he's like, don't worry. I already bought you from your dad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I'm going to give him uh, 30 shekels in a fetid calf. We already worked that yeah, out. Yeah, no, we worked it out and everything. <laughs> if you look at subsection B. And then she's so delighted. She's so delighted. She's like, oh, did Drew put you up to this? It's like, yeah. oh my God. Slash cut over to Drew just doing the like, uh -uh gesture. Like, no, I, was, fuck, I think that's weird. <laughs> He gives her these flowers that he's brought with her. Again, I had to write this down. This is so fucking weird. He says, quote, the iris symbolizes Jesus and how we need to build our identity around him to be truly satisfied. And the roses represent the need for purity in our relationship. Meaning <laughs> I'm going to need to check your hymen before. <laughs> yeah. oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, I am a doctor, so I'm qualified. But if you'd like a colleague of mine to do it, oh, God. I have a buddy who's a vet and it's basically the same thing. Oh, I, I didn't realize that there was even such a thing as the least sexy sentence until I heard that. But there you have it. It's we have found it. It took us a while. All right. Well, I tell I tell you what. I I don't know about you guys, but I feel like Act Two is the best time to establish a love interest in a romance movie. So we're gonna pause there long enough for the script to take a victory lap. But first, let me give Act Three the hard sell. Whatever happened to her interior design project? Who the fuck was the blonde girl from that one scene? What purpose did the Stewart character serve in this script? Find out the answers to one of these questions, and that's it. When we return for the <laughs> lazily plotting conclusion of Princess Cut. 
Hi, welcome to a big cell phone company retail store. Hi, yeah, I noticed all these hidden charges on my bill. Right. Well, you're a lady person, uh, so I'm going to be incredibly condescending and not helpful at all. You see, this right here is a phone. Got that. Phone. Is there any chance someone in here won't treat me like a speech-delayed toddler? Oh, for that, you're going to want Mint Mobile. What's Mint Mobile? Mint Mobile offers a premium wireless service starting at just $15 a month. 15 bucks a month? What's the catch? There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they were the first company to sell wireless service online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you. And I don't get talked to like someone is translating to Swahili while I talk? That's right. I switched over to Mint Mobile when they became a sponsor, and now my whole family is on it, which is why I, Eli Bosnick, personally endorse Mint Mobile. All right. I'm in. Where do I sign up? To get your wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get that plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash gam. That's mintmobile.com slash gam. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash gam. Uh, now, can I interest you in a speaker? You're going to try to sell me things after not helping me? Amazingly, yes, I am. <laughs> Lou, 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 do a teenage girl stuff. Teenage girl stuff is my favorite stuff. Princess, do you have a second? Sure, Dad. Sure, Mom. What's up? Well, honey, we know that you and Jeremy have been dating for a while now. It'll be a year at homecoming. That's right. That's right. And we know that, well, there can be certain physical pressures on a relationship around these times. <sighs> Dad. Now hear your father out. That's right, Peanut. I don't want to talk about this kind of thing any more than you do, but God has a plan for how you treat your body, which is why, with his guidance, me and your mother think it's time you gave Jeremy the old yankaroo. I'm, sorry, I'm what? Sweetie, listen to your father. That's right, kiddo. It's time to bat the bishop, choke the monkey, give him that 360 twist with the gawk. Honey, I think that last one is a blowjob. Well, I don't know, Sharon. I'm flustered. But, but, but how do I know if Jeremy and I are ready? It's not about that sweet beef. It's about what our wizard friend wants. And our wizard friend wants you to milk Jeremy like you just finished a handshake round at the leprosy ward and his dingle shoots out hand sanitizer. All right. Uh, if you say so, I guess. But, but mom, dad. Yes, pudding. This is pretty much exactly as creepy as what Christians actually do, isn't it? Sure is, kiddo. Sure is. <laughs> and we're back for still more of this shit and we're going to rejoin the action with a quick Grace and Clint are dating Christianly montage right <laughs> <laughs> no trying to kiss her in this one can I just throw out here that we are now on the third fucking relationship of this movie I know uh. why did we have to have Stuart Jared and Stuart were doing the same work I don't this montage is so insipid that I wrote in my notes I'm barely exaggerating that in my darkest moments when my suicidal tendencies are at their most pronounced, part of what keeps me alive is that these people haven't killed themselves, <laughs> so I can't. <laughs> oh, no. I, can't, I can't do it. I can't, I can't make the jump if this woman's like, I'm doing a great job. Do to do. Have a sandwich. No. Them first, then me. Jesus Christ. And so the key, though, to this dating montage, as opposed to the one that we got with Jared earlier, is that Clint is dating her whole family, right? Mm -hmm. she, he's he's dancing with mom and he's goofing off with the kid. He, he takes the, the brother along for putt putt because you know how women love it when you take their brothers with them on your date. Oh, nothing like it. Exactly. And he's part of the baking to go meet apparently another new neighbor taking right. another package, <laughs> some kind of carrying more food to someone. He's baking with them now. Yeah, exactly. Right. Also, again, with the random close-ups, why are we getting close-ups of the ball, of the putt-putt ball? Why do we need that? I feel like the, the guy who owned that putt-putt course was like, all right, I'll let you use my putt-putt course, but I'm going to need some B-roll for my ad. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and we watch them. They fish for a while because that's boring, right? They So they, we watch them fish, and then they, they push each other playfully. Oh, oh. How bad did you guys want to watch them just like committing a hate crime together? 
Just dragging a teen behind their truck. I think I'll think go for a walk Eli. outside. <laughs> Eli Bosnick. I didn't make uh, that's them. They do that. No, I didn't. <laughs> So, but the but the and the montage ends with all of them playing a board game together as a family, right? The same board yes, game. Yes, life. They're play. They really like life. Also, the people who made this movie are so fucking stupid. They don't know how life works because he wins and the, he ends it by going, "All of this is mine," which is not how the game of life. <laughs> nope. works. You don't win the game of life. <laughs> That's Monopoly. You're thinking of man. That's Monopoly. Yes, right. But anyway, so there's suddenly a, a ring on the doorbell right as he's finishing the game. And I wrote in my notes, I'm like, well, it better be a goddamn conflict because what the fuck is this movie even about? And here they serve you up the perfect conflict. Don't they, though? <laughs> it's Tessa, the best friend. And she is pissed because she called dibs on that penis. Right? Yep. I mean, the most implausible argument had by two grown women ever is oh. what I wrote. So fucking stupid. And the language gets pretty harsh. At one point, Tessa says, you, you double crosser. Uh. <laughs> By the way, I did look it up and the Dove Family Reviews website does warn us that she calls her a double crosser. Yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> so, it's so delightfully stupid. She's like, well, you either break up with him right this minute or we're not friends anymore. And, and, and Grace is like, that can't possibly be the plot is it and she's like it's the closest thing we've got for now the only way for this movie to be more insipid at this point is for her to get deathly ill because she didn't get a cootie shot before kissing jerry <laughs> <laughs> so, and then and the movie's like okay yeah no that's not enough conflict that's a terrible conflict like, we, we, we can step it up we can step it up and just so Brooke the evil blonde lady that we saw for eight seconds in the first act shows back up and she's looking for Clint right mm -hmm. now we know this actress from right to believe saving faith and God's not dead too and yes she was the faith of saving faith Yeah, and Amy you might recognize her from her face was the model for medieval plague masks <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know if you know that no. it comes to a no. perfect point. Oh my yeah. God. Um, <laughs> oh my God. So, and apparently what she's done, she's narrowed him down to a city or two, right? She knows he's somewhere in this part of North Carolina. So she's just driving around town with his fucking headshot, asking random people if they know this guy. Yep. Right. And she just happens to find... Who is it? Our favorite Jewish therapist. Oh, is that who it was? Yeah. Our oh. favorite Jewish therapist. Mm -hmm. Exactly. She's the one outside of the roadhouse. Oh, yeah, she's right. the therapist. She's sitting there. She's like, I'm telling you, just tell him it's a vaccine. We'll track everyone. What's that? <laughs> oh, yeah. He lives down the road, honey. <laughs> so. Like I am. So. <laughs> She's, he, and she's like, yeah, no, I know exactly where he is. He's at this such and such a farm and whatever. So she's like, oh, okay, well, that this is all, uh, very much a plot now. And she's like, oh, yeah, no, totally a plot. <laughs> and then we cut back to Grace and her mom. They're in the kitchen doing lady stuff. This was, I think, the first time we saw a mom in an apron, which was shocking to me that it took yeah. this long. No, no, I beg to differ. We saw her in her apron when she was dancing with Clint. Oh, you're right. Oh, that's Double right. Yeah. But nope, that you're was right. just the last scene. So you're right. Yeah. This is where she pulls out the final batch of cookies. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so we know we're getting to the end. Oh, my yeah, God. We're right, making yeah. it to the end of the movie. Yeah, we're that's, almost that's, there. that's the pacing of the film, right? That's this film's ticking clock is how long it's going to take those fucking <laughs> cookies to cool down. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So, but like the conversation they're having is like that scene with Tessa was fucking dumb, right? And they're like, yeah, mm -hmm. I was fucking dumb. We're just going to resolve that kind of off screen later. And he's like, oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> and so just then, Brooke shows up at their house. Right? She says, I'm looking for Clint Masters. We've never I don't know that we've ever given this character a name. So we're just like, I think she means the doctor guy. I think right? that's the oh doctor. my God. His name is Master. Yes. Yep. Clint Master. Yes. Oh my, oh my God. We're going to go to my favorite Japanese restaurant, Mizo Jajani. <laughs> so, 
So. <laughs> Oh, did they do that on purpose or was that just like Oh, yes. I mean, her name oh, is know Grace, is. okay? It was absolutely, yeah. oh, it was absolutely oh on purpose. And let me clarify the plot here so that everyone can live in the horror that we lived in. So here's what happened. Clint used to date this girl, but then they fucked and he was like, ah, we fucked too early. I dump you now and bury our wedding. Bury the ring I was going to propose to you with in a shallow grave near my new farm. <laughs> yes. Right? <laughs> Now, in order to keep the characters from knowing and explaining this for the remaining 22 minutes of the movie, everyone will speak like an Alzheimer's patient <laughs> wandering through the old age home where there's been a fire and there's no one there to lead them back to their rooms for the rest of the film. <laughs> She's like, I'm looking for Clint Masters. She goes, are you related? She goes, not yet. And Grace has no follow-up questions. She's like, sounds good to me. Come on in. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you stay at our home for the remainder of the movie? <laughs> what? You just met this. She just randomly pulled up in your driveway. No, you wouldn't. You live here now. <laughs> yes, I do. Right. So she goes upstairs. Grace is showing her her room. She's like, so where are you from? She's like, Colorado. She's like, I've heard of that state. I know that one. It's a square, isn't it? I think it's a square. And and that's the amount of conversation they can allow these two characters to have without it coming up that she's dating Clint. Yeah. Except they really do want you to know that she's evil again. And she immediately starts putting on makeup. Right. Slut right. Makeup. Yes. And I would like to point out that she's wearing a red scarf. Oh, she is, isn't she? I've now watched this woman in like 17 movies <laughs> and 17 times in a row. Some white Christian man has been like, but can you put your lipstick on all, you know, hoary? And she's been like, trust me, uh, this is my move. <laughs> Maybe you've seen my work in God's Not Dead 17. <laughs> so it actually says that on my CV. It just says that I can do that. So, yeah. So <laughs> she's like, so how do you know Clinton? She's like, oh, well, you know, he was my boyfriend back in the day and I want to get back together with him. So how do you know Clinton? She's like, interesting that you asked. And it's a very good question. I'm glad that I got that question today. Oh, my mom's calling me. I got to go to the kitchen now. <laughs> so fucking dumb. What's that? It's the not resolution of the movie. I must go now. Yeah. <laughs> right. So she and, and there's also this great moment in case you haven't picked up on the fact that Brooke is the bad guy. She goes, oh, I've got to help my mom in the kitchen. And Brooke goes, Psh, kitchen. Why don't you go to a restaurant like a feminist? <laughs> well, it's it's actually it's not even written that smartly. She goes, I would just go to a restaurant. And it's like, rather than help my mom in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> The food is already being cooked. Like, right. this is a weird... <laughs> Why don't you just grub hub your mom's so... cookies? So, okay. So that night, everybody's having dinner. That's the, the whole family, Clint and Clint's ex-girlfriend who's here. Right? Yeah. yeah. So they, they, and of course, the whole family goes to say Grace and Brooke is like, this is so quaint and stupid. <laughs> They start passing around food and Brooke's like, you remember, Clint, that you and I used to make cornbread and then fuck, remember? She literally says, do you remember the food that we ate? And he's like, no. And she's like, <laughs> yes, you do. Liar. Oh, God. The writer, I feel like at this point, the people should just be saying opening brackets, indistinct chatter, closing brackets. So... <laughs> <laughs> and then they all make, they go, who made the cornbread? <gasps> Grace made the cornbread? Oh, is that Grace's oh, cornbread? I did make yeah. the cornbread. Oh, it's good cornbread. It's like, see, good she can cook. Oh, she can make cornbread. I've got to marry her. Yeah. Or you would go to a restaurant, you slut what? with blonde hair. <laughs> Clint turns to the ex-girlfriend. You hear that? I want to eat Grace's cornbread. <laughs> it's raw. So, yeah, so she, and, and then middle brother tries to justify his existence in the movie by going, so, Brooke, what brings you here to East Bend, North Carolina? And she's like, oh, I'm stalking Clint, <laughs> obviously. Clint, what the fuck did you think brought me here? I literally <laughs> showed up at the door asking for him. Oh, no, I'm here for high school. I just also thought I'd stalk someone with a headshot while I was here. <laughs> Doing a summer abroad and go fuck yourself, North Carolina. <laughs> This is why you only have two lines. 
but then the, dad explains at this point that if they can finish the harvest in time, he's going to host a great big harvest festival. Right. Right. And, and Brooke is like, what does those words mean? <laughs> a harvest festival. It's when good Americans get together and we put a pie in an oven and, and you we're pull it up by its bootstraps. And and proud to be an American. He's so vague in his answer that she goes, wait, do you give all the soybeans away? And he's like, no. Nope, that's not a harvest festival. Well, it's so sick because he's like, well, when you when, when the Lord blesses you with great bounty, you give some to other people. And she's like, giving things to other people. That's dumb. She says, she says, she says what a strange idea. Yes. No. <laughs> Chari- what is this charity of which you speak? I wanted her to just put her hands in the mashed potatoes. <laughs> Right, just like gets two handfuls of mashed potatoes, starts eating them. You know, what your, what what is a person? <laughs> so okay, so and then Clint gets a phone call, right? So he's got to leave, and you think it's like a beeper situation. You finally think, oh, he's a doctor. Finally, he's going to go do something doctory. Nope. Okay, keep going. Nope. Ne- nope. Never going to happen. Yeah. So he leaves, and and Brooke chases him down, and he says, I don't. I haven't unbroken up with you or anything, okay? All right? And she's like, oh, well, I guess you've made that super clear, and now there's no longer a conflict between the two of us at all with 20 minutes left in the fucking movie. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> also, it's an entirely ADR scene, at least on his part. Yes. Yeah. And can I just say... Thank God for once they got outside and they were like, man, these crickets are really fucking loud. You know what we should do? <laughs> yeah. So it's the next morning. Everybody's all on the truck getting ready to harvest them some soybeans. But then da, da, da. Clint shows up in the combine. That's no. right. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. Apparently the phone call that he got that other day, that was the, in the previous scene. That was his friend, Mike, who can fix anything. And so he fixed the combine. The hot yep. rich doctor saved us. Right. Fuck yeah, he did. So, and, and I don't know, because because he's like, well, you know, he's a great auto mechanic. And I figured might as well give him a shot. Like, I feel like knowing how to work on cars and combines would be a super duper different skill right. set. Just... Details, details, Noah. <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah, actually, it turns out. All of the cars that Mike worked on up until that point started pulling shit up from the ground whenever they go places. This is the first time it's worked out for him. <laughs> Mike's right. found his no, calling. Yeah. So, but yeah, now they have the combine and we don't have to watch them do menial labor anymore, which is great. I'm happy about that. So then we cut to them setting up the big harvest festival. And damn it if Tessa doesn't show up. Remember from she was they had conflict because she would call the dibs. Right. Tessa shows up and she's like, hey, I, I heard that the plot was about something else in between <laughs> scenes just now. So I forgive you or whatever. Yes. Yes. <laughs> she's like, oh, it's OK, Tessa. Brooke showed up. We have a way better conflict now. <laughs> yeah. I wrote in my notes. I feel like at this point, the movie is vigorously rubbing our left flap and asking us, is this a plot? Is this a plot? How about now? <laughs> Uh, we pan over this uh, fucking North Carolina family potluck, and I'm like, if there's a hell, this is where I go when I die, right? I, I'm just, I'm here, and everybody wants to ask me which highway I took on the way into town, right? <laughs> the people who made this movie were too cheap to provide food at this <laughs> fake potluck. So everyone is just shot from like the neck up yeah. and like <laughs> holding empty forks in their mouths, being like, rabble, 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 rabble. Peas and carrots, peas and carrots. This is the rap party. This is the actual yeah. rap party. Oh, and yeah, it's like right, a right. Luck. Everybody who was in it locally just brings something to eat for the rap party. Everybody shows up with corn on the cob. Yeah. <laughs> so they all head over to fucking shoot traps or whatever the hell this is. And honestly, look, because we, we open this scene on everybody loading shotguns. I'm like, if the next 15 minutes of this are just Brooke going John Wick on this whole shitty town, it will have been worth oh, it. Oh, so good. <laughs> right. I would have loved it. That would have been amazing, actually. That would have been yes. interesting. Yeah, yeah. But despite the fact that this movie has been like country, <laughs> despite the fact that this movie is essentially a banjo, not a single person... <laughs> 
will hold a gun properly for the rest of the movie. They're holding them between their teeth. They've got them between their knees. They're doing handstands and loading them with their feet. <laughs> And I love to, so we get this long montage of everybody shooting at clay pigeons, but no one ever misses, right? Every single shot, well, except Brooke, right? Where she tries, she fucks up. Only Brooke, yeah, yeah. Right, but everybody else hits it. And then they have to have like one person be like, oh, well, you're very good at this. Oh, well, if you would like lessons, I will teach you. But it's like, you're all equally good. No one has missed. Yeah. You need a harder hobby. (laughs) There's also no rules. They don't clarify that this is a contest. We just watch them like standing at a lake fishing and they're like, sorry, is this the climax of the movie? I think it might be the climax of the movie. Right. At one point, Clint says, well, I made it onto the third round or I made it out of the second round or whatever. And we're like, wait, there are rounds. And no, by the way, we'll never find out who wins or anything. No, we'll never come back to that. He's like, I made it to the second round. Who gives a fuck? Next scene. (laughs) Yes. Right. It's inconsequential. Everybody shoots guns. It's just the pastime. Right. It's just, you know, understood. All they want you to know is that good people have guns. Yes. And bad people don't. Yes. Grace is shoot Grace shoots guns good because she's a good Christian girl. Yeah. And Brooke can't shoot guns at all because she's a fucking feminist. And she's from the city. From the big city. <laughs> Yeah, and she turns around and points the gun at everybody because she doesn't even know which end the bullets come out of. That would have been our John Wick moment. And then the shit fucking cock blocked that like he does everything else. (laughs) So, okay. So then who should show up at the big potluck but Jared? Remember Weird from the- Jared. Yeah. Hey, I, I heard you needed an uh, yet a third plot point to finally <laughs> kill this movie like a buffalo we've been following for the last 80 <laughs> days and 80 nights. Stalker. So and then so Brooke goes storming off and she and Jared meet. Jared starts flirting with her. Jared is there to see Grace and he's just like, oh, she's a cute blonde. I should probably try to fuck her while I'm walking by. In a very Skeevy way. I mean, yes. Skeevy. Yes. It's just like, hey, pretty lady, how are yes. you doing? It's just, it's so fucking bad. <laughs> Ugh. And I think to myself, like, okay, it would be really, really incredibly lazy and stupid if this movie just matches the two of them up. But don't worry, it's going to be lazier and stupider than that. <laughs> no, that would have been amazing. That would yes. have been wonderful. You know, compared to the alternative, yes. And we we had the moment. Yeah. Because they were going to go have psycho sex together. You could see it. He was like, hey, do you want to pee on my chest? And she was like, I do want to pee on your chest. (laughs) It's going to be a happy ending for everybody. And they blew it. (laughs) But no, instead, they're like, hey, do you want to wander off and enact vengeance against the main characters? And she's like, do I? (laughs) So, So Jared and Brooke, they go back to the trap shoot with a plan in mind. Right. Step one, Brooke has to trick Grace into leaving. So she's like, hey, your dad said he needed something in the shop or whatever you call that red building with the big doors. And she's like, oh, yeah, okay, man. But I'm like, her dad's there. He's in the camera. He's on the fucking <laughs> screen. No, no. Yes. Are you serious? I, I didn't notice him on the on the screen, but like, what? He's <laughs> he's the jet. Like, he started this fucking trap shoot. Why would he not be there then? Right? Like, we haven't seen the mom there. She could say your mom needs you. That would make perfect fucking sense. But oh yeah, where is the mom? She's just gone. She's made baking cookies somewhere. She's she saw she's pulling cookies out of the eternal cookie oven. <laughs> <she lives laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, okay, Brooke goes back to the barn to see what her dad wants, but damn it if Jared's not waiting there for her. Mm, mm, mm. And he Ooh. brought her a necklace. Oh, yeah, he did. He brought yeah. her a pearl necklace. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, I want to start over with you, Brooke. I want to have a good relationship. And she's like, well, cornering me in a barn is a shit start. Let me just tell you. <laughs> and can I just say the writers are so stupid because they've written this is Jared's like rapey aggressive scene, but it's also Jared's I'm trying to get back with you scene. So he's presenting her with a necklace in a rapey aggressive manner. He's like, hey, oh, yes, I got you this and you're going to wear it. All right. Oh, you'll be wearing this necklace. <laughs> 
So we cut back to the trap shoot where basically Brooke keeps trying to give him an over the pants and he keeps slapping her hand away. <laughs> right? Like a horse trying to keep flies off of its shit with its tail or something. <gasps> right? And then he notices that dad is there and he's like, wait a minute, this doesn't add up at all. <laughs> something fishy is going yes, on right, here. Yeah. <laughs> So we cut back to the barn. Jared is now getting as violent adjacent as this movie is comfortable <laughs> getting. Because I think this movie doesn't know what rape is based on its worldview. So they were like, how about he just grabs her shoulders? And they were like, yeah, shoulder grab, shoulder grab. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, right. Well, I think they just they didn't want to give grandma a heart attack. Right. Yeah. They didn't, sure. Her yeah. ticker can't really take a lot of moving around real fast type of shit. So he's he aggressively grabs her and Clint shows up and he's like, hey, get your hands off of her. Yeah. And now Jared and Clint have to have a fight. OK. Oh, and what a fight it is. <laughs> <laughs> this is this. These two dance captains. I don't know what the fuck. There's like they might as well do like the kitten mitten slappy slap. <laughs> There's like, it opens it opens with what's his name trying to kill him with a shovel. Right. right? Oh, that's the thing. <laughs> right. His first act is like, all right, well, if I behead you with the shovel, I will win this fight. <laughs> <laughs> and then dad shows up and dad's like, get off my property. <laughs> and he does. Hey, can I just say something? If someone ever tries to rape my kid, they will not be leaving my property. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, no, no police, nothing. Nothing. Just get off my property again. Like it's like a repeat with the thin, thinning hair guy. And also the fucking heroic "I'll be back," you know, "Hasta la vista, baby" line in this movie is "You kids, get off my damn lawn." <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then he tells Brooke to leave too, and he's like, "You too, little missy." He's literally ruder to the real estate agent than he is to the guy <laughs> who tries to rape his daughter. And then there's this great moment where Brooke is like, I'm not leaving without Clint's penis. And he's like, well, I'm not giving you my penis. She's like, well, I guess I'm leaving. <laughs> literally. She's like, I'm not leaving. Clint's like, please leave. And she's like, OK. And then is never seen for the rest of the fucking yes, movie. She just changes her mind because she's like, yeah, right. We're not going to I'm not going to fight Grace now. That would be repetitive. <laughs> so, oh, God almighty. I mean, just very quickly, I wish that there were like outtakes of the fight choreography. That would make me so happy. I would that would be I would watch that over and over again. Bryce, Bryce, get off my hair, dude. Dude, get off my hair. (laughs) Be careful with the shovel. Be careful with the shovel. I don't care that it's pretend. It still hurts. (laughs) Jesus. So yeah. So, but Clint says, I sure am sorry that things got so violent and he leaves and he leaves for a week. Right. Oh, I don't think I noticed that. (laughs) Yeah, I was was in a a coma by then. In a few states. Oh, yeah, exactly. That makes sense. He was. He leaves for a fucking week. We cut to the it's like I thought it was the next morning, but no, it's like six or seven days later. The family's all having breakfast. And and of course, they're still talking about how exciting that was. And Grace is like, hey, dad. Why would God let Brooke come here and fuck up all of the relationship thing that I had going with Clint? And dad's like, I'm a I'm a Christian, so none of my claims ever have to stand up to evidence or or logic. I don't understand why we I'm sure we've explained this to you before. Maybe God wanted you to fuck someone you never thought of. before, (laughs) Honey, maybe maybe there was someone under your nose the whole time. God. Would just absolutely destroy that thing. So, <laughs> so, but mom's like, you know, and she's like, why would Clint leave? He has, I haven't seen him in a week. And she's like, maybe you should write him a letter about how awesome God is. And she's like, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. I should write a letter. That's a thing that people from this century have ever done. Sure. Mm-hmm. I will write him a fucking letter. So we cut to her writing him a fucking letter. Yep. <laughs> in her little teenage room, in her little girl room. Yes. Yeah. Dear Clint, I don't know where you are right now, 
Why are you gone? <laughs> See you later. This movie doesn't make any sense. Yeah, but we cut to, as she's writing the letter, we cut to him and he's gone back to Colorado or whatever to dig up that engagement ring and bring it back. Oh! At first, we just see him digging. I wanted him so badly to be burying Brooke. <laughs> <He's just> like, <laughs> All right, problem Jesus solved. <laughs> so now it's the next day, or sometime later, or whatever. And Dad's like, "Hey, are you guys ready to go on our big camping excursion?" And she's like, "What a weird way for you to say that you're ready to leave." But okay, yeah, sure. Like exposition delivered, I guess. So. They're out camping. We, we cut dad's cooking some hot dogs or whatever. And he says, oh, you know what? I'm about ready. Drew, why don't you go get your sister? She's off looking at a, a over the edge of a mountainside into a sunset or something. I'm sure. I just to give everyone an idea of how bored I was by the movie at this point. <laughs> I held Merge Mansion on my phone in front of the screen <laughs> so I could play Merge Mansion while technically by definition <laughs> watching this movie at the same time. Oh, that's where I was. Jesus. So, yeah. So we cut to her, like looking out over the fucking mountainside or whatever. And who should show up? But Clint. Oh, it turns out this whole camping excursion was his idea so that he could surprise ask her to marry him while her family was right there. Isn't that so sweet? And again, even though it's the fucking title of the movie, they do not reveal that the ring is a princess cut. Nope, God. they sure don't. Which is like, was that purposeful? Was that, me are we meant to think that like she doesn't need the princess cut anymore or are they just- Oh, interesting. In no, it? they just forgot because the brain damage they got from that pumpkin spice latte incident is pretty severe. <laughs> I think they just couldn't get an actual diamond cut. I think they were like- Oh, that's we interesting. Just, no just can't question. can't get that ring. We yeah. just don't have that. No, they went to the nicest Zales at their local mall and they were like, what can I get? For 85 American dollars. <laughs> and they were like, can we borrow this ring? And they were like, fuck no. 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 You can film it here in the store. That's it. We'll <laughs> name it after the ring. Does not matter. We, we don't, don't care. No one will watch it. Well, I'm going to name it after the ring it's anyway. Like Noah, Eli, and Amy who see the fucking thing. Wish so. I could fuck my daughter. So, Jesus <laughs> And so, but she says yes, and then and then we cut to like I guess that a quick happily ever after wrap up scene, and they have this cutesy like, aren't you happy in our lives? And 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 at a moment, there's this kid that runs out, and it's supposed to be like, look, we have a kid now. Except in my head, they just kidnapped a child, and she was escaping. <laughs> <laughs> and we see the resolution is that women are. Breeders, they're meant to yes. breed. She did not need to go to school. <laughs> no, nope. evil mm -mm. school. Just kills your brother. That's all school does. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Makes you have burping contests with your friends. <laughs> right. And the guy, when secretly, like her doctor husband is is like forty five years old. And yeah. She's yeah. yeah. Getting his AARP card at their wedding. <laughs> All right, well, Amy, thank you so much for toughing it out with us. I know we ask a lot more of our guests than most podcasts do. You've been a great sport, and it's been a ton of fun to have you on. Thank you so much, you guys. This was this literally made my entire, I want to say, whole year, which is really life. sad. Life. My life, yeah, my life. life, my life. Yeah, let's, really, let's, not, let's not understate it. Yeah. My life has <laughs> been changed. Thank you. <laughs> Amy's just going to walk out onto a dock with stones in her pockets when this record <laughs> oh, is over. Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right, well, that's going to do it for our review of The Princess Cut. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still haven't learned our lesson about doing this thing every week. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. Well, Noah, next week we actually have an emergency episode oh, do drop. We? Because on September 7th, the year of our Lord 2022, the right-wing website Breitbart will be dropping their expose dramamentary about the president's son. And God damn it, if we're going to miss it, we'll be watching... My son Hunter. Oh, is that the fucking one with the uh, like transphobic 
Mandalorian, yeah, chicken, from, and all. Oh, Star Wars, lady. Oh, yeah. No. All right. <laughs> so with that to look forward to, we're going to make episode 368 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Amy for helping us out with today, and an even huger thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist, Citation to DD Minus, and The Skeptic Ride of wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson handles our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by our Ryan Slotnick of Evil Drafts on Mars. All other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm an illusionist promise to work harder and another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club clothes. Grace and Clint went on to have awkward and deeply unsatisfying sex. Brooke and Jared went on to have that good, good psycho sex and also break up in public on Facebook a bunch. Yeah, probably. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved. Bonus days are back for pros. Only at Lowe's. Get savings on new...